Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 as we are making our way back to Jesus' famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. We've taken a bit of a break on the Sermon on the Mount as we've been dealing with uh, worldwide pandemics and so forth, but uh, I think it's time for us to come back. As you can see on the screen, we will be studying today chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Let's read God's holy word. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, as you can probably tell, today we are going to be talking about vows and oaths pretty timely topic for John and Michaela, who in a few weeks will be making their vows, their oaths before the Lord and others as they start a new family in marriage. Now, so we can start to understand our context, why don't we underline some words here? Because this text on the surface could maybe seem a bit confusing, but as I believe we will see once we understand the entire context, it's very clear and very simple what our Lord was saying. Uh, number one, if you want to underline in verse 33, twice we see the words vows. Then in verse 34, at the beginning, you see the word oath. And then at the beginning of verse 36, you see the word oath. So again, we understand what the main theme of this text is, vows and oaths. Now, interestingly, in the Greek, the word for vow and oath, it's one Greek word, orkos. And the word, it's... it's it literally means to fence something in. Uh, it means to bind together, to enclose. In the context of making vows and oaths to the Lord, what you're doing is you are taking a promise that you have made and you are binding it and closing it, fencing it in, in the name of God. You are making an oath, as we saw a few weeks back in Hebrews 6.16, um, by someone greater, by God himself, and therefore there should be no question that you're going to fulfill that oath, right? Now, in verse 33, we, we see this idea of false vows. Uh, it comes from the same word, ortikos, of vows or oaths, but false vows, epi, Orkeo, perjury, swearing falsely, lying. And so we're going to see 
a contrast here in this text of true vows and false vows. Now, again, as I said earlier, on the surface, it almost seems like, and I don't want to sound blasphemous by saying this, but it almost seems like our Lord is kind of contradicting himself in this text. What do I mean? Again, at the end of verse 33, he says, you shall fulfill, quoting Old Testament, you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. And then in verse 34, our Lord says, but I say to you, make no oath at all. Kind of sounds like he's contradicting himself, right? Again, in verse 36, he says the same thing, nor shall you make an oath by your head and, and, and so forth. So what exactly is, is going on in this text? Well, remember when we had first started this section way back before the coronavirus began, we learned something very important. We learned that in this section, our Lord was contradicting that which, watch me here, the people were told or what was said to them by the religious leaders. And our Lord, it's just one Greek word, arethe, which literally refers to human oral tradition. And as we saw when we started this section, the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, they believed in the Old Testament scriptures, obviously, and they would take sections of the Old Testament scriptures and they would twist those scriptures obviously to fit their sinful desires and they would interpret or better yet misinterpret the Old Testament scriptures and they would come up with human oral religious traditions. Arethe. So when we see our Lord saying to the crowd there at the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard that it was said, or you were told. Automatically, that's a red flag. Uh-oh. Jesus is talking about human oral tradition. And that's why every time in this section, after Jesus says, you've heard or you were told, he counters that by saying, but I say to you. Do you see it? And so, in our text for today, we see this. Again, in verse 33, you've heard that the ancients were told. Arete, red flag right there. And then verse 34, but I say to you. Do, do you see it? So, we know something's going on here. Now, again, let's broaden out our context a little bit, just as a reminder. It was after our Lord had chosen his 12 apostles that he was on a mountainside, and it was there that he preached his famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon that is found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, as well as Luke chapter 6. Now, we know that in that crowd that was listening to this sermon, you had three groups of people. First group, small group, Jesus' disciples. And our Lord in this sermon was teaching them his standards not to earn salvation. He was speaking to his disciples. And he was giving them the king's standards for them, the king's disciples who were part of the king's kingdom, 
So remember our Lord started out this sermon by pronouncing blessings, beatitudes, on his disciples, saying, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you who mourn. Blessed are you who are merciful. Blessed are you who are persecuted for my name. And then our Lord said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light to the world. Let your light shine so that they, the world, will see your works and glorify my Father. So our Lord starts out this sermon primarily focused on his disciples, how they were to live as citizens, the king's citizens, in the king's kingdom according to the king's standards, right? Now, there was a second group, the large group listening to this sermon, non-believers. And there was a third group, the group that Jesus ripped into, the hypocritical religious leaders, primarily made up of scribes who were theological teachers who had theological training and education, you had the scribes and you had the Pharisees, a group of pious laymen who were the ones who tried to hold fast to the Old Testament scriptures. They were the interpreters. And so you've got three groups, right? Small group of believers large group of non-believers and a group of religious hypocrites who were looking for any and every reason to discredit Jesus. Well, remember, after our Lord started this sermon, pronouncing blessings on his followers, also telling his followers they are to be, go out into the world, to the earth. The very world and earth is going to persecute them, persecute them for the name of Christ. After telling them to be salt and light to the earth, our Lord in chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, now starts to shift the focus a little bit by saying, Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets, i.e. the Old Testament. You can understand why maybe people in the crowd may have thought that, because they had never heard teaching like the teaching from our Lord. Well, that makes sense. He's God in the flesh, right? So Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Again, think of our context. He had just been speaking to his disciples. Blessed are you. Go out into the world. Be salt and light. Jesus was teaching his disciples that his people are to live counter to the culture. Right? We are to be salt and light influencers not influenced by the culture. And that's obviously very important for us to understand now as we see all the chaos happening in culture, right? As Christians, we are to be salt and light. And we don't compromise the king's standards. We live to the king's standards by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, not that we're trying to earn our salvation. We're already saved. And we want to have that salt and light influence on a very dark and decaying world. And then our Lord transitions, verses 17 and 18, saying, Hey guys, speaking to the big crowd there, don't, don't think I've come to change things of the Old Testament. Because again, what Jesus was preaching was very different as compared to what the religious hypocrites have been saying, right? Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to what? But to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, 
not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law, the Old Testament, until all is accomplished. What our Lord was saying was this. He came to fulfill all righteousness. He came to fulfill all the law. For whom? The elect. Who unfortunately were lawbreakers. Well, what do we do then with God's law from the Old Testament? God doesn't just toss his law out. Someone has to fulfill it. Unfortunately, we can't, right? We're lawbreakers. We're sinners. So our Lord says, don't think I came to abolish the Old Testament. I came to perfectly fulfill it. I came to perfectly fulfill all righteousness, right? And then our Lord broadens this and now speaks to the large crowd of non-believers, verse 20, where he says, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness, you non-believers, surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you know the religious hypocrites who looked great on the outside, but inside were filled with dead man's bones, right? Jesus said to the large crowd of non-believers, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Ba-boom! Talk about an explosion. Imagine, you're back then, listen, during that time, listening to that sermon. You're looking at the scribes and Pharisees. These were the religious elite. And you saw all their external religiosity. And you're thinking to yourself, well, if anybody's going to earn their righteousness, it's got to be them. I mean, look at all they do to make themselves right with God. And can you imagine all of a sudden Jesus says here, right at the beginning of a sermon, um, they're not going to heaven. Ba-boom! <laughs> right? Imagine like, Crescio John, we're, we're, we're sitting back there during, the ser the, during that sermon going, what did he just say? They're not going to heaven? Well, Jesus says, yeah. You see, the reason why he came to fulfill all righteousness is because only he can do it, right? The religious leaders, oh, they had all the external trappings. They looked good in man's eyes, but internally they were hypocrites, right? And so Jesus says to the crowd of non-believers, you can trust in my righteousness? Did I perfectly fulfill it? If you don't want to trust me, good. You want to get to heaven? Your righteousness has to exceed theirs because they're not getting to heaven. Okay, Jesus. John would ask, maybe. <laughs> how much further, how much more does my righteousness need to exceed theirs? Simple, verse 48. Jesus makes it very clear. One sentence, um, you're to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There it is. You don't want to trust in the righteousness of Christ? You want to try to do it yourself? Go for it! But here's God's standard. You have to be perfect. Every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, you get the point. And oh, by the way, back to verse 20, your righteousness has to exceed the hypocritical righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Why? Because their righteousness was simply external in the things they did or didn't do. And inside, they were wretched, hypocritical sinners. And Jesus says right here in verse 20, uh-uh, 
God doesn't just look at the outward act. He looks at the inner attitude. For example, verse 21, Jesus starts out this section by saying, You have heard that the ancients were told. Watch me. Arete. Red flag, we know this refers to oral human tradition from the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. You've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Actually, you're first and foremost liable before God. But then look what Jesus says, verse 22. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Do you see that explosion, that bomb in that sermon? What was Jesus saying? The reason why the religious leaders are not going to get to heaven it's because they think they can make themselves righteous, A, through their own efforts, and they think God is kind of just grading on a curve. As long as externally they didn't murder somebody, they're okay. Jesus, no, 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 no. God also looks at the inward heart. Anger. Hatred. Murder. You've heard what the religious leader said, human oral tradition. As long as externally you don't murder somebody, you're okay in God's eyes. Jesus, but I say to you, God looks at your heart also. Anybody here think they can earn their righteousness through their own good efforts? I mean, assuming you've never been angry before, right? <laughs> right? You've never called somebody a fool, right? Then Jesus goes to the next example. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said, arethe, you shall not commit adultery. Hey, as long as we don't do the external act, we're okay in God's eyes. Verse 28, Jesus, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with, uh-oh, lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whoa, do you see why Jesus had said in verse 20 to the crowd, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you're not getting to heaven? Because again, God doesn't just simply look at the external act. He looks at the inner attitude. Anybody here think they don't need Jesus and his righteousness? <laughs> Verse 31, another example, the last section we left off on before the corona pandemic. Jesus said, it was said, here we go, arete, red flag, we know this is oral tradition. A twisting of the Old Testament scripture. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, real simple, just have the paperwork and you're okay in God's eyes. Let him give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32, uh -uh. but I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, porneia, right? Adultery? Makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Do you understand the context of this section? You have heard from man's mouth, but I, the Lord of truth, say to you. Make sense? Now let's go to our text for today. Another example of the hypocrisy, the duplicity of the religious leaders. Verse 33, again, you have heard that the ancients, finished the sentence, were told, arete, red flag, we understand something's off here. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows. Okay, that doesn't seem like they twisted anything. But you shall fulfill your vows, orcos, to the Lord. Okay, I don't know. Does anybody here see anything wrong with this? Well, obviously there was something wrong with this, right? Because look at verse 34. What does Jesus say? But I say to you, 
So that tells you right now the religious leaders had twisted stuff, right? But I say to you, make no oath at all. Again, now it sounds like Jesus said you're not allowed to make any oaths. So John, Michaela, in a couple weeks, we don't make any oath. What, what are we doing here? Well, let me help you understand even more of the context. And then we will return back to Matthew. And it's going to be very clear to you, by God's grace, what Jesus was saying here. Right? Let's take a look at a couple Old Testament passages. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Ten Commandments. Third Commandment, about vows and oaths, right? Swearing in the name of the Lord. Verse 7. Third Commandment, you shall not take, I want you to underline this, the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Underline the name of the Lord, your God. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished, underline again, who takes his name in vain. You'll see why we're emphasizing that in a few moments. Okay, very clear, right? Go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. Again, God speaking through Moses. We read, You shall not swear falsely by, underline this, by my name so as to profane, underline this, the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. By the way, does it sound like God is prohibiting the idea of making vows and oaths? No. Not stopping them, but God is saying, make sure you keep them, right? Let's go to Numbers chapter 30. Look at verse 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, underline to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Pretty clear, right? God wasn't prohibiting vows and oaths. But God was setting the parameters, right? Hop over to um, Deuteronomy 23. One more example. Look at verse 21. Again, God speaking to and through Moses. When you make a vow to the Lord, underline to the Lord, your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. So I just gave you four quick examples where God does not prohibit people making vows and oaths. Certainly, vows and oaths in the name of the Lord, you know, kind of shows. <laughs> it's kind of like a kind of a slap at us as sinners. <laughs> and we we have to add a vow in order to make our word true right but nevertheless god was not prohibiting vows and oaths right now go back to matthew and let's now see if we can understand this text verse 33 jesus says again you have heard that the ancients arethe were told red flag you shall not make false vows. Well, we read that in the Old Testament. That's true. That was true. But you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. We read that several times. You underlined it, right? So I don't get what's wrong here. But obviously something was wrong when it came to what the people were told. Because Jesus said in verse 34, I say to you, Make no oath at all. Now, again, we now understand Jesus is not prohibiting oaths, right? Remember uh, several weeks back, we studied Hebrews 6? We saw that God himself made an oath to himself, right? Not that he needed to, but to prove to Abraham, to show Abraham and all of Abraham's descendants, including us, 
the God's word, God's oath can never change, right? Jesus. Every time Jesus says truly, truly, or verily, verily, he's saying amen, amen. It's an oath. Remember Jesus before Caiaphas, Matthew 26? The high priest said, I charge you under oath. Tell us if you are the Son of Man. Jesus responded under an oath. And again, we see in the Old Testament, God made provision for his people to make vows and oaths in his name, right? So we know that Jesus here is not prohibiting vows and oaths. So then what was the problem here that the religious leaders were telling the people? Look at the end of verse 33. Quoting Old Testament scripture, you've heard that it was said, you shall not, you shall fulfill your vows. Look at the emphasis. To the Lord. And the scribes and Pharisees twisted that and did this. If you make a vow using the Lord's name, guess what? Now you're stuck. You've got to fulfill it. It's binding. But they said, if you make a vow in any other name, Guess what? It's not binding. For instance, the religious leaders came up with an elaborate system of oath making that was lie making. Watch here. If we fulfill our vows to the Lord, I mean, if we use the name of the Lord in a vow or oath, okay, we're buying, we're, we're, we have to do it. But if I make a vow or an oath in the name of heaven, and if I don't keep it, I'm okay. Or if I make a vow or oath, when it comes to the earth, I'm okay if I don't keep it. It's not binding. If I make a vow or oath, you know, Jerusalem? I know what I promised you, Crescio, in the name of Jerusalem. I didn't do it in the name of the Lord. Or if I make a vow or oath on my head, Maybe I'll fulfill it, maybe I won't, but I'm not guilty in God's eyes because I didn't use the name of the Lord. You see what they did? They start, okay, in the name of the Lord, binding. And then they just kind of took it in a descending process. Heaven, I mean, that's big time. It's up there, but it's not the name of the Lord. Well... Let's lower, let's make it less binding. The earth instead of heaven. You see how it goes down? You know what? Let's, let's make it even a little less binding. Jerusalem instead of the whole earth. Let's make it a little less binding. How about my head? D do you see what they were doing? Think about when, um, I'm going to age myself. Those, <laughs> those of us um, who you know, have that gray hair. Remember when we were younger um, and we would make a promise to somebody, our parents, a friend, and we knew that we needed to keep that promise unless we did watch, crossed our fingers and put them behind our back. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> Denise is popping up. Yeah. Remember? You Pharisee? <laughs> Do you see what we did? We... Or, and I'm really aging myself, let's see, I don't know, if, Tara, you, you and I in sports may get this one. Uh, remember, we would make a promise to somebody, 
We knew we couldn't keep it. We just wanted to impress them, right? Or to get something based on that promise that we knew we wouldn't keep. So you know what we were doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. And then if I walked away and either silently under my breath or from my mouth, but not too loud where so-and-so would hear it, if I said the word psych, anybody remember that? <laughs> Denise, you and I were Pharisees, right? So if I'm promising you, Michaela and John, that I will be there to perform your wedding ceremony. I promise you. And if I don't show up, you can't hold it against Because I didn't make the promise in the name of the Lord. And I crossed my fingers. Or I make the promise to you, Michaela and John, and under my breath, I just walk away and go, psych. Do you see it? You see this, the, the duplicity in that? Now, again, it's one thing as little kids doing it. We're talking about the religious leaders here. We're talking about the people who were supposed to be the guardians of Old Testament Scripture. And so, in our text here, this is what Jesus was slamming the religious leaders for. Again, verse 33, he said to the crowd, You've heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows only to the Lord. In his, if you made a vow in his name. Jesus said, verse 34, But I say to you, make no oath at all. He's not prohibiting oaths, but he's, say, he's prohibiting Flippant, hypocritical, duplicitous, deceptive oaths like the Pharisees and scribes were making by heaven. Because Jesus said, uh, sorry, just because you don't use the name of the Lord in your oath, by making an oath, even on using the name heaven, it's still binding. Why? Um, because heaven's the throne of God. And oh, by the way, verse 35, if you think it's, you're going to get away with something by making an oath in the name of the earth instead of the name of the Lord, um, understand something? The earth is the footstool of God. Oh, if you think you're going to get away, it's less binding by making an oath in the name of Jerusalem, you know, small little city. Um, understand it's the city of the great king. And oh, by the way, verse 36, don't try to make an oath and think, oh, you're going to get away with something. You can lie simply because you make the oath on your head because um, you know what you cannot make one hair white or black but God can because you owns your head and that's why Jesus said let your statement simply be what yes and make sure your yes is your yes you don't need to go through an elaborate system of oath making let your no mean no. Anything beyond these, Jesus said, is of evil or of the evil one, who is, by the way, the father of what? Lies. Is this not mind-boggling? When you think of these religious, hypocritical leaders, they were leading people straight to hell. Because they were taking Old Testament Scripture and they were twisting it and turning it to fit their sinful, selfish, self-centered, self-righteous lifestyles. Hey, as long as we didn't murder anybody externally or commit adultery externally, as long as I have the proper pa paperwork uh, uh, you know, to divorce, or if I make a vow, as long as I don't use the name of the Lord, I can lie left and right. Maybe I'll keep the vow. Maybe I won't. And guess what? I'm okay in God's eyes. Hop over to Matthew 23 real quick. Let's see what Jesus had to say about that. Some more details. Verse 16. Jesus said to them, Woe to you. He was pronouncing condemnation on them. 
Woe to you, blind guides. You say, well, whoever swears or makes an oath by the temple, well, that's nothing. It's not binding. But whoever swears by the gold on the temple, well, that's binding. You see what they were doing? Jesus said, you fools, you blind men. Which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? By the way, God owns both. Verse 18, what else did they say? Well, you say, they were saying, you know, whoever swears by the altar, you know what, that's not binding. We can get away with not keeping it, uh, the, the oath, because it's not binding, they said. But if we swear by, you know, the offering on it, well, then we're obligated. Jesus said, you blind men. Which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears by both the altar and by everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple swears by both the temple and by him who dwells within it. Whoever swears by heaven swears by both the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Do you understand what was happening back then. Their oath-making was lie-making. Back to Matthew 5. Again, verse 33, Jesus said, You've heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows. Just to the Lord. But I say to you, Make no oath at all, neither by heaven, because it's God's foot throne, it's the throne of God. Just by using the name heaven doesn't make it less binding. Or by earth, because it's the footsole of his faith. Or by Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. And here it is. It's real simple. Jesus says, let your statement be. If you say yes, it's yes. Why? Because when you say yes, Christian, you're saying it as though you made an oath in the name of the Lord. You say no, Jesus says your no is your no. And it is as binding as though you had made a vow or oath in the name of the Lord. In other words, one syllable, yes or no, is enough. Because Jesus said anything beyond this is of evil or the evil one, right? Do you understand the text? You understand what was going on? Do you understand why Jesus said in verse 20 to the crowd of non-believers they're saying, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you see how hypocritical their righteousness was? Jesus said to, to the crowd, you're not getting to heaven. But do you also understand why Jesus said in verses 17 and 18, don't think I've come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. Jesus says, not one jot or tittle will be changed until all is accomplished. Why? Because, friends, we're all law breakers. And think about it. It starts when we're little kids, right? Actually starts in our mother's womb, Psalm 51, right? We have a sin nature. And think about the elaborate system of lies we've come up with in our lives. Crossing our fingers? Saying, psych? <laughs> I mean, what? And there's no way any of us, through our own efforts, can make ourselves right or righteous in God's eyes. Wouldn't you agree? Unless, of course, you think you can be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect in your thoughts, words, and deeds. Anybody think that? Good. You know how many religions teach that today? Not based on the Word of God. 
but based on oral tradition. Jesus came to fulfill the law perfectly. For us, the law breakers. Again, God's holy truth must be obeyed perfectly, right? It's God's standard. Problem is, none of us can do it. I mean, think about how much you struggle keeping God's law just externally. How about internally? I mean, we don't have a chance through our own efforts. And one slip up, one sin, one act of lawlessness, whether external act or internal attitude, punishment's damnation, hell. God's a just judge. But he's also a loving, compassionate God. And 2,000 years ago, he showed his love by sending his son to this earth, Jesus. Born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning he was born without a sin nature. Jesus, truly God, truly man, perfectly fulfilled all righteousness for us. And then went to the cross, and as he hung there, our lawlessness was placed on him, our sins. He was punished with the wrath of God, the wrath that we deserve. Jesus died, but three days later, he rose in victory. He overcame sin and death for us. And through Jesus Christ and him alone, we have forgiveness of sins in terms of that day of judgment. We have the free gift of eternal life. The righteousness of Christ is credited to our account. So that when God looks at you, Christian, he declares, Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Do you honestly think that through your own efforts, you can be perfect as God is perfect? External acts and internal attitude? You think that's going to get you to heaven? I mean, it's insane. Yet, all the world religions teach that. Because they are based on man's traditions. That's why we teach the truth. We're not interested in what oral tradition says. We are interested in what our Lord says. But I say to you, right? And I pray that all of you, you understand your desperate need for Jesus the Savior. I pray that you understand that there's no way you can make yourself right in God's eyes through your own efforts. And I pray that you have repented of your sins and that you have placed your faith and trust in Christ alone. That he fulfilled all righteousness for you, he paid for your unrighteousness in full, and that you have looked to Jesus, submitted to him as Lord and Savior, and cried out to him, begging him for mercy on your soul. I pray you've done that. Because if you haven't, you're calling Jesus a liar here. In other words, you're calling him the devil. And for the rest of us who have trusted in Christ, not because of anything good in us, but because of his grace to us, as citizens of the kingdom, the kingdom of our great King, Jesus Christ. Every word that comes out of our mouths needs to be so binding 
as though we made an oath or a vow in the name of the Lord, right? We used to be citizens of the kingdom of Satan. Of course we told lies. That was our native language. But by God's grace, we are now citizens of Christ's kingdom. We speak a different language. It's called truth. God is the God of truth. He is truth, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? God the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. We as God's chosen, redeemed, regenerated, sealed people need to be people of the truth. Listen to me. No matter how much it might cost you. I think about the economy is now slowly starting to open up and obviously people have been devastated in their businesses, including Christians. And if I'm talking about you, can you be a Christian where your yes is yes and your no is no? even as you're trying to restart your business and you know that it, if you just told a little white lie, it might benefit you. By the way, you do realize there's no such thing as a white lie. Isn't it interesting? We came up with that statement to justify lying. Well, it's just a white lie. Well, let me ask you a question. Moms, when you were pregnant, were you just a little pregnant or were you pregnant? Think of lying. There's no such thing as a white lie. It's a black lie, right? It's a lie. Husbands, wives. Can your yes be yes and your no be no? That's it. You don't need to add anything else to that. Can your spouse count on you as a person of truth? Parents, same thing when it comes to your children. You know, your children, you think doesn't, they don't listen to anything you say. Listen, oh, they listen to every word you say, including the lies. And I promise you, it will boomerang back to you and they'll bring it up and justify their lies as they get older and remind you of how you had lied. Be careful. Employees, employers. Christian, we're counter to culture. We are representing our great God of truth. Can your yes be yes and your no be no? Can your word be so certain and so binding as though you made a vow or oath in the name of the Lord? How about amongst your friends, including non-believers? Can they see the difference in the way you speak? Guys, what we're seeing going on in this nation right now, all the hurt, all the hatred, all the um, vitriol that's just spewing out of people's mouths, Our words need to be different. Words of truth. Honoring our God of truth. Again, I'll say, no matter the cost. We used to speak a different language. Came naturally to us, didn't it? But we were in a different kingdom at that time, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. By God's grace, we're in the kingdom of light. And as people of the light, we speak the truth. And you can use only one syllable. 
And it should be so binding as though you made a thousand oaths in the name of God, right? Let's go to Psalm 19 where we began the service and we'll conclude here. That's why we need to be immersed in the word of truth constantly. The word of truth, verse 7, that we read is perfect. It restores the soul, doesn't it? The testimony of the Lord is what? True. You can count on it. It doesn't change. It is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, right? Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And Christian, as you are immersed in the word of truth, we read, this is how we're warned. When we start to maybe get loosey-goosey with the words that come out of our mouths, by God's holy word, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, God's word is that guard, that guide, that protection where we are warned. And in keeping God's word, there's great reward, not earning our salvation, but as kingdoms, uh, citizens who have already been saved. And I love what David the psalmist says here. Look at his humility and honesty, verse 12. Who can discern his errors? In other words, David's going, God, I know I'm not perfect. And God, I know that I can even fool myself. Who can discern his errors? And he says, acquit me of hidden faults. Wow. You know, those sins that are hiding in the inner recesses of us, the nooks and crannies. Boy, when you expose your heart to God's penetrating light of truth, this is how we're warned. This is how we can discern our errors. This is how we can be kept and acquitted of hidden faults. And look at his prayer, verse 13. Also keep back your servant from what? Presumptuous sins. Wow. You know, maybe telling a white lie in order to win. Maybe not telling full truth, part of it. Keep me from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. And I love this conclusion here. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We're going to now spend a few moments in silent prayer. You know where you are. For some of you, make today the day where you truly and honestly by the grace of God repent of your sins and trust in Christ alone for salvation. Hopefully you've learned today the absolute impossibility of making yourself right in God's eyes and acceptable to God through your own efforts. Hopefully you've learned that today. Cry out to the Lord. 
beg Him for saving mercy. And for the rest of us who are citizens in the King's kingdom, think about the words that have come out of your mouth recently. Think about the meditation of your heart as of late. Now's your time to be open and honest with your merciful, most gracious God.